I think it's a, it's a potential issue, and I think there is a potential correction, but probably not yet. In today's video, Raul Pal, the co-founder and CEO of Real Vision takes over the helm to update us on what's driving global markets, his big picture outlook, and how AI is going to change the way we work. Liquidity is everything. All of my forward-looking indicators have been suggesting that liquidity is going to keep rising and that it would drive crypto and tech more than anything else. And that's basically been the story of the year so far. Um, and I think that that continues. And that's confused a lot of people. The one trade that's confused me is the bond trade, and that's confused a lot of people. Bond yields should have fallen by now, and they still haven't. But I think this is to do with the debt ceiling issue, which is the other confusing thing. Because the debt ceiling issue has some real risks around it. And we don't really know how to price them. All we do know is people are pretty bearish around it. Um, and I think that's reasonable too, to have hedged around it, because we don't know what can happen. But the chances are that anything that causes a paralysis of financial markets will lead to that, that expression I always use, more cowbell, more stimulus to come. The market is insanely bearish, mm. which is why we, the Nasdaq's up 1.8% today because people just don't want to believe it. They're angry. They want the market to go down. They want their bear market and they want their justice. And it's not happening. And the reason being is everybody's ridiculously, ludicrously short. On the flip side of the equation, we're going into this, and that's obviously driven by the debt ceiling. The other side of the debt ceiling is this chart, which is the speculative positioning in bonds. Now, bonds, as I mentioned before, have not been playing ball. I thought yields should be falling, but they haven't yet. But look what's going on here. This is the largest speculative short positioning in the history of the bond market. So if anything changes at the margin here, we're going to see a gigantic rally in bonds, which I'm still expecting. But this whole debt ceiling dynamic is getting in the way. Inflation dynamics on the mean on the um, on the other hand are falling very fast. Things like the Truflation Index, which is a real-time calculation on chain of millions of prices, suggests that US CPI as of today is 2.2%, uh, 3.2%. I think it still goes to zero by June or July, which Alex Gurevich has been talking about both on Real Vision and also on Twitter as well. We're very in a small camp of that. We're also seeing wage growth coming down. We're seeing rents, are, rent, rents and wages are the most lagging of all. Um, so they're all still to come down. So generally speaking, economy slowing. We've got this whole debt ceiling stuff that's getting people very nervous. The resolution of that one way or the other ends up being ongoing liquidity as the economy slows. The banking issues have slowed down for the time being, but doesn't mean it's gone away. These things tend to come in phases. Um, and so technology and crypto tend to outperform. Crypto has been um, consolidating for a while, but it's still up 50, 60 percent on the year, still the best performing asset. But again, it's likely to pick up as liquidity comes forward, as shown by our forward looking liquidity indicators. And we've probably got 20 or 30 different things we could show you to say that liquidity is going up. So yeah. I remain massively bullish. There will be a correction at some point in all of this. As people start throwing in the towel on the short positions, then we might get a, a correction before we continue to move higher um, later on in the summer. So overall, super bullish. The only one that's puzzling me is the bond market still hasn't played ball. But I think we need to get through this debt ceiling thing. And then a lot of hedges get unwound. Could you see stocks and bonds both rallying or, or are they going to move in inverse? I think stocks and bonds will both rally eventually. Um, that's that's what the big call is. That's what I think happens. Mm. So I think stocks and bonds rally, as I said, uh, um, technology, crypto rally the most. If I just look down my Bloomberg right now, you know, the S&P is up 8%. The Nasdaq's up 25%. I've been, you know, I've been saying this since last year and everyone thought I was crazy. The exponential age basket that I talked about in Real Vision that everyone thought I was a complete idiot for, that's up about 40% this year. Um, and, um, you know, crypto, which everybody thought was completely dead, is up 50, 60, 70 percent, depending on what you're looking at. Stuff like Solana is up 120 percent. I've been in that trap basically, 
basically since 2012. It's yeah. but like you, you know, valuations keep going up, the market goes up, you don't really understand it, you don't want to get involved, so you stay out of it, you start to look for smaller opportunities and you miss the big thing. And I, it's only until I started to understand what was driving it that it was driven by, A, this massive technological revolution going on, but also the Fed balance sheets and the global central bank balance sheets. Once I understood it, it became much easier to just buy it. And also, I also did a lot of work in the everything code to figure out that P ratios and being driven actually by the balance sheet and global M2. It's all monetary phenomena. And it's not about, it's not about earnings anymore. Everything is driven by one thing. And is this in the post GFC environment? Is that it's, why it's so hard for people? Just because the models that everyone was brought up on using are just not, they just don't function in that in that world where central yeah, banks I mean, are I was just reading the FT just before we came on and Carl Icahn is talking about how he lost 9 billion hedging since 2012. Yeah. Or oh, no, since later than that, because he's been expecting the crash. But I keep saying this 50% correction in equities can't happen. Because simply, they just expand the balance sheet and the denominator takes care of the fall and they rise. So it, it just simply can't happen. The only way that it could happen is if we see massive quantitative tightening. But then the economy goes down the toilet and they've got the unemployment side of the equation, the inflation side. So it, it just can't happen right now. Now, that's not mean this will stay forever. But it's a situation that quantitative easing is used as a way to pay the debts uh, and particularly the interest payments on the government debt. And that was, again, part of this everything code that everybody reset their interest rates to zero in 2009. Everybody, every country. It was like a global reset. I only realized it recently that that was the global reset. And so everybody's now in this debt cycle of every three to five years of having to roll the debt. The interest payments get monetized. And that is the increase in the balance sheets. It, it, it almost exactly works out for the US, the UK, Japan, Europe, et cetera. They're all just the monetization of the interest payments. Just sticking on the liquidity issue for a moment, um, a couple different people are saying, do you think that we'll see a decrease? The markets will fall after the debt ceiling gets resolved because liquidity will fall. I think having to do with some of the mechanics TGA of, stuff, that's yeah, right. and Andreas has, you know, been covering this really closely so, with Steno Signals. There is a possibility, and we saw this in 2011. The S&P fell 20%. Now, what it did was correct 76% of the rally that it had. Could we see a similar move here as the shenanigans around the debt ceiling mean that the TGA gets rebuilt? Yes. Which is why I said, listen, there's going to be a correction here at some point, but it may be from higher than here because the market's in this short squeeze because everybody's hedged for this thing. And so it just squeezes everybody up. And then, yes, I think that there's a very decent likelihood of that. And in fact, I put out a trade recommendation for for um, um, pro macro around the ideas of this, which is that, listen, there's, there's a risk of this causing a sharp pullback, but the outcome will be more liquidity. So there's actually two ways of playing this in the end. So yes, I, I think it's a it's a potential issue. And I think there is a potential correction, but probably not yet. Is it possible that we are approaching a deflationary cliff with AI at the same time we're filled with inflation fears? <laughs> Isn't the fear of deflation more powerful to a central bank than inflation? They aim at for 2% inflation, a little bit of inflation, okay, not so with deflation. So, so it's sort of a two-part question. And I've, again, I'm very out of consensus on this. I think inflation headline CPI gets to zero or even negative over by the summer. It then picks up again. Um, and what we will then see is the slow effects of owner's equivalent rents, services inflation, which is mainly owner's equivalent rents and wages. That usually lags on for 18 months. So that keeps inflation low coming out of a recession. And I think the AI thing as I've talked about, is a deflationary nuclear bomb in all of this. So I think the probability is that unemployment is sticky coming out of this, stickier than expected, and inflation is not as rampant. So even if commodity prices, and I understand there's some tightness in commodity markets, 
but everybody's tried to take that trade has been taken out and shot right now by the market. Mm -hmm. And Dwight Anderson warned us about this on Real Vision. He's like, yep, they're tight, but there's no demand. And if you keep looking at the supply side of the equation, you'll get carried out because the demand equation will kill it. He said, you know, the next time we come into the upside of the business cycle, we are going to get some commodity inflation, but that can be easily offset by deflation of AI, much like we saw in the mid 2000s with China coming in. Um, they caused a massive spike in, in uh, commodity prices, but inflation was relatively sanguine because of the effect of China in the WTO meant that goods were coming out cheaper, globalization. This side, we've got AI, which is hugely disruptive, balancing against the commodity inflation that can come. So I, I think inflation is slower than the market expects.